Whether in a soccer stadium or in the chemical arena, public perception and consumer demands are the key drivers for substitution. So I suggest we get the ball rolling and start our interview on substitution with Valérie Moise from Cabot Corp and Jerke Lichthardt from Chemsec. Welcome. Thank you. Our viewers want to know the score, so please tell us what is the current state of the chemical substitution practices in the chemical industry and what are the main drivers behind the trend? So, um, speaking for Cabot, of course, uh, while I think all chemical industry is uh, committed to serve the market with innovative products that are safe and sustainable, of course, uh, for Cabot, substitution is not a new concept. Um, we have within our uh, HS health and safety and environmental goals and targets some objective. Um, and we try always to reduce the number of hazardous chemicals that we are using for our workers, but also for the consumer. So we have a, a review program where we look into our portfolio and raw material. The main problem is always uh, when we want to substitute, we are looking at a similar performance and that requires always quite resources uh, from the R&D standpoint as well. We need to convince our customer to switch. So those are uh, a little bit of the challenges, but the main driver, while the chemical legislation compliance is key, is always we, we want to uh, provide uh, the, the consumer with products that enhance their everyday life. Wonderful. And Jerke, what kind of substitution trends do you see? Yes, of course we see that regulation is uh, one of the major drivers for substitution. That is, I think that has always been and will always be. But also when you look at uh, the downstream users, because they are close to the consumers and uh, they see the push from the consumer side that they want safer chemicals. So that is also a driver for substitution in that sense. But then, of course, uh, within ChemSec, we're working also with the chemical producers. We have a product called uh, ChemScore, where we rank the world's largest chemical producers. And they already see the writing on the wall. And this is going to happen. We need to have safer alternatives available. And this uh, is, of course, also a very big driver from their side. They see the f where the future market will be, and that is safer chemicals. And for ChemScore, so the public perception basically for these companies, uh, are they voluntarily on the list or are you just ranking companies? We are just ranking them. We are going for the 50 largest chemical producers worldwide which are stocklisted. Okay, interesting. Um, Valerie, what criteria and considerations do chemical companies typically use to identify chemicals suitable for substitution? Okay. Um, as I said earlier, we have our continuous improvement plan. So we look for chemicals that matches with our goals. Uh, we look at raw materials that are better for the workers, better for health, better for the environment. Um, always looking for performance equivalence. As I said, we look at the life cycle uh, throughout the, the uses. And at Cabot, we have different type of product that goes um, in, in many, many areas, from tires to the, the pharmaceutical industry. So that's also the, the complexity we, we, ha we have there. We look at opportunities as well. What would make your life better? Um, examples, we were trying to reduce uh, the CMRs in our raw materials, or, or if we cannot uh, remove it because it's needed for a performance, we look for a way to implement in a raw material that will reduce the exposure. Example, a, a, mineral, uh, a, 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 a mineral pigment that was usually used in powder, we've purchased it uh, in form of a master batch, so that was reducing the exposure to our workers. That's an example. We are also in our specialty component business looking at safer alternative to replace the PFAS, because we have some PFAS in our portfolio still. Okay, great examples. Um, can you also provide some examples of successful substitution, Jerker? Uh, I think successful uh, substitution, I think uh, BPA, uh, phthalates, they have all been uh, phased out in the most uh, important areas. So I think that is really something that uh, could be shown. And uh, one of my personal favorites actually of a successful substitution is uh, a popcorn bag. For example, in uh, the Coop Denmark, they, uh, a couple of years ago, they were really aware of the PFAS problem and they were looking f 
to substitute PFAS. And they were talking to their supplier, can you get rid of PFAS in the popcorn microwave popcorn bags? And the supplier said, no, no, we can't, we can't. You have to, you have to deal with it. Okay, so they took a very, very bold decision. They said, okay, you're out. We are not going to buy any popcorn bag with, uh, with PFAS in it. And what happened? Half a year later, oh, we got a substitute for you. And they could again bring the microwave popcorn bags without PFAS onto the shelves. So this is really what, what normally is a successful substitution. That's a bold move by someone, be regulators or be companies, that they really say, we don't accept this and you have to solve the problem. Problem solved. So this is really one of my personal favorites because it really shows what downstream users can do. And now that is mainstream. Everyone has PFAS-free popcorn microwave uh, bags. So I think it's a great example. I think so too. And uh, you see then the impact of many stakeholders, uh, how they can impact uh, and influence the supply chain. Chameleons, a different topic. Chameleons can provide great camouflage. While looking for the same characteristics, we often end up with similar challenges, while real change is needed. Jerke, can you provide with some examples of regrettable substitution? Again, phthalates is a very good example. If you consider what happened when uh, the first phthalates uh, got uh, on the uh, REACH candidate list, uh, quite now many years ago, what happened was that uh, there was just a shift from one phthalate or banned phthalate or listed phthalate to the ones which were not listed, that had not been identified yet. So this is a classical example of a regrettable substitution. You just do what you have to do to dodge regulation. So that is not substitution. It's by word only, but it, not, it doesn't have any real effect. And I think the PFAS is again a good, very good example of a regrettable substitution because you often, uh, you went from long chain PFAS and that was dubbed by industry, oh, well, the long chains are the problematic ones. Let's go for the short chain ones. So what happened? Okay, you substitu substituted PFOA and PFOS with Gen X, for example. And I think the communities living around the factories where Gen X uh, was uh, produced, I think they beg to differ that it's actually a safer, uh, safer alternative and a good substitution. So it's a so classical example of non-substitution or non-true substitution. Okay, so real change is needed. Yeah. Um, Valerie, are there specific industries or applications within the chemical sector where chemical substitution is particularly challenging or more urgent? I would say challenging. Uh, one example um, is synthetic amorphous silica. There is uh, an intention from the evaluating member states to classify synthetic amorphous silica as a stot re one for inhalation risks. Um, but silica, synthetic amorphous silica is used in toothpaste that provides a clean, uh, a soft cleaning agent like some other minerals that could be used, uh, for example, for example, sorry, calcium carbonate, that would uh, damage a little bit your dental animal, while silica provides really the soft cleaning. So it could be a public health issue. Um, I'm also thinking about, uh, because on the table right now we have, we have PFAS, we have some siloxanes. Uh, in um, PFAS in firefighting foam, um, the industry, uh, the chlorosilane industry, is testing right now other types, other alternatives for those uh, FFF. And from a safety standpoint, they are not sure, again, performance, they are not sure that they have an equivalent performance that would guarantee the safety of the firefighters, of the uh, workers, or the surroundings when sometimes you have those plants that are um, implanted into uh, um, uh, local neighborhood or, or those kind of things. Okay, um, Jerker, any uh, yeah. specifics uh, uh, that are urgent from your end? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with the, with the challenges. Uh, what is really challenging, of course, that is when you have uh, certification schemes like for medical devices or aviation and things like that. That is, becomes a challenge in itself because you have the, uh, it's a very long process before you are allowed to implement an alternative. Even though you have it in place, you have verified it, but to have that, uh, so time-wise, it's a, quite a challenge. When it comes to urgency, I think 
we're talking about two main things. Uh, first of all, it's persistent chemicals. Because once they're out, they are out. They will stay there forever. So persistent ones are the most urgent ones, uh, that's for sure. And then, of course, when you're looking at uh, exposure to consumers. And consumers, uh, they believe it or not, they actually believe that the things they're buying in the shop does not contain any hazardous chemicals that can harm them. They actually believe this. I can't understand how, but that's the way. So phasing out hazardous chemicals from consumer products, I think that is also really, really urgent from, uh, from uh, our point of view. And do you think that the consumer perspective will be more demanding uh, over time as well? I think it will be, uh, because uh, the more knowledge that the consumer gets about uh, what, what's in the articles they're buying, the more, I think, the more vocal they will be and the more they will be pushing the brands and retailers to provide them uh, with, uh, with what they want, and that is safe products. Is that something you see already for your products? Um, in certain cases, yes. Um, since the PFAS proposal has been, has been made, we had a lot of customers asking, do you have any PFAS in the formulation that I'm buying from you? So yeah, that, that's definitely a trend that is upcoming. Having said that, we had yesterday a very good example uh, with the sunscreen where those um, little app, app on the phone tells you it has a bad score, but is the consumer, I'm a consumer too, is a consumer really able to understand the response of the app? Because on the exposure part of it, if the hazard is not related to the type, to the root of exposure, then it's not, I mean, for me, expo risk and exposure are, are, it's not only about the hazard, risk and exposure are very important. And if the hazard is not related to uh, the way you are exposed to it, then the risk is controlled. Yeah, and I think this is uh, one of the main differences between industry and uh, the civil society because we see that uh, consumers, they can't be expected to know exactly how to use something safely. And when you have a hazardous chemical in the product, in the, well, in, the, kind of in the cash line for uh, the grocery shopping, it's so frequent that I see that uh, parents, they give uh, the, the cash receipts to the children because that keeps them happy. So uh, what was in the cash receipt before with uh, BPA in it? Was this a good, it wasn't really supposed to be uh, chewed on and played with by a kid in the, in the, in the cashier, but it happened. And that can never ever be foreseen by any risk assessor. So this is the, the reason why we think that hazard is the main driver and risk, okay, that you can apply in certain instances, but hazard, that is really the thing that makes a difference. What are primary the barriers or challenges faced by companies when attempting to substitute chemicals and how can these be overcome, Valerie? Uh, main challenges, cost, I mean, we need to be realistic. <laughs> the, the time as well, the, the significant uh, R&D resources. Um, also, at the beginning, when we start to look at uh, those new product or substitutes, we don't necessarily have the complete data set that would enable us to make the adequate determination about safety. So that's also one problem because as, as you mentioned, the PFAS long chain versus short chain, uh, from the beginning, you don't know if your, your substitute is gonna be safer than what you are trying to exchange. So uh, that's, very, that, that's also an important point. Life cycle is important, all the, the uses, how, how, we, how the consumer, how the worker are using the product, where is it ending up? Um, so yeah, it's, uh, that, that's the, the, main, the main difficulties, I would say. Okay. How do regulations and government policies influence the decision to substitute chemicals in the industry? Is there a need for moving the goalposts? I think, uh, depending on what you put in the meaning of moving the goalposts, but I think regulation is always a starting point. You have to have proper regulation. And uh, if you don't have regulation, you can't really... Uh, you can't really make any change. But then, of course, uh, you also need transparency. And uh, I think this is where what, what has to become a mainstream, and that is transparency. That if it's uh, not mainstream to be transparent about what you produce and what's in the articles which is sent through the supply chain, I think that is 
the transparency part that that is what is needed to help the whole supply chain to move up the information how it's being used and move down what uh, the product cons uh, consists of i think that is really the information flow up and down that is really necessary final question you are both in the league of your own valerie eh, as industry and jaker as ngo what lessons can be learned from successful cases of chemical substitution and how can these lessons be applied more broadly within the industry and by policymakers, or in other words, eh, what do you think can be the biggest game changer? Um, lesson learned, there is always trade-off. I don't think there is one-to-one substitution, one -one substitution that is a win all the time. Um, we have a circular reinforced Zinc carbon in our portfolio. Um, when that some are produced by end-of-life tires, pyrolysisol, um, with the same or at least similar quality and performances, which is great. They have ISCC plus certification. So we are hitting the sustainability target there. Uh, but if you used reclaimed carbon only from those same uh, recovered tired, you do not hit the same level of performance. Imagine you will use that in tires. What about your adherence on the road? That could be a problem. So there is always trade-off. You always have those, start, you, you, those compromise either on the quality or on the performance. And I'm hopeful not on safety, of course, because that's all the purpose of it. Life cycle is important and we need to look in the entirety of that to really say uh, it's successful in the substitution. And it's not successful tomorrow, it's successful after maybe 20 years, because in some cases, you discover new things about the, substance, the substances after a, a while, I would say. Okay, Jack, what do you think can be the biggest game changer? I think, uh, as mentioned before, it's uh, the transparency part. Uh, because uh, with transparency, you can do so much more. Uh, you have the knowledge and uh, also, like you, like you mentioned, I very much agree on that, that there is not one-on-one -on -one when it comes to substitution. One, one, uh, what, one chemical that we have today will have 20 or 50 different uh, substitutes depending on the application. So it's so important that um, the application that you, it's not always just screamed out, yeah, but there is no one-on-one. -on -one. So we, can't have, we don't have an uh, alternative. So the substitutes, they really have to be safe today and they have to be safe tomorrow. That is, of course, I, again, I, I agree. But with the transparency on how it's being used, where it can, can you find it and what are the properties. With that, I think uh, that is really needed. But also bold moves from retailers, from brands, and from, of course, from policymakers. Okay. That is what's needed. Jack and Valerie, thank you for sharing your perceptions. Never change a winning team, but if the public perception is substitute now, real change is needed. And to make this happen, we all need to keep our eyes on the ball and act as a team. Thank, thank you. you.